Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to Prof. Grayling's talk this afternoon. My name is Kwok Kian Woon, and I'm very happy to moderate the session today. Uh, first off, uh, also a very happy Deepavali or Diwali to all who celebrate this, and it's a theme which is perhaps not unrelated to today's uh, uh, session, a good life in a bad world. Now, we will not be taking too much time to read out uh, Prof. Grayling's long CV. That would take up lots of time. All right? We assume that all of us know uh, that Prof. Grayling is not only an academic philosopher, but somebody who has tried to reach out to non-specialist audiences and uh, in his books, but also in popular media. And today is yet another, another such occasion. Uh, let's do this. Uh, Prof. Grayling will speak for 40 to 45 minutes, but we'll try to leave as much time as possible for, for discussion, open discussion. So uh, on that note, uh, may I invite Prof. Grayling to begin? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Woon. Thank you, and a great pleasure to be in Singapore. So my theme is a good life in a bad world. And uh, uh, because my day job is I'm a, a teacher of philosophy, I always tell my students that they must define their terms. So I must explain to you what I mean by a good life. And then I want to talk a little bit about the ways in which the world is not quite suited uh, to encouraging a good life unless we make very definite and deliberate choices to live such a life. Now, the first thing I must say is that when I talk about a good life, I don't mean a sort of goody two-shoes kind of life. That is a life which is uh, as close as possible to some conventional moral norm. Um, and it's important to notice this because there's a big difference in a way between ethical reflection and questions of morality. Ethics and morals are not quite the same thing. You can see that from the etymology of the two terms. The word ethics comes from a, a Greek word, ethos, meaning character. And it relates to the question, the question asked by Socrates of his fellow Athenians, what sort of people should we be? What kind of lives should we live? What values should we choose that would color and shape our lives so that we can live them in ways which are uh, flourishing and satisfying? Live lives which feel good to live. So when I talk about a good life, I mean a life of flourishing and of uh, achievement, a life that feels good to live, and which on the whole and in the main is good in its impact on other people. I say on the whole and in the main because it's quite hard to live a life which is uh, satisfying and uh, full of achievement, which doesn't just very occasionally involve treading on somebody else's toes. It's, it's difficult to um, forge ahead with one's ambitions and hopes, if one is always oversensitive towards the interests and needs of others. But the interests and needs of others matter hugely. And our concern for others, uh, our sentiment of kindness towards our fellows, our neighbors in the human story, is a really very important feature of a life which is well lived. But so I mean by the phrase a good life, a life which is good to live. It doesn't necessarily mean a life which uh, always obeys what happens to be the current morality of the society in which you find yourself. Morality is a much narrower matter than ethics. It's about right and wrong, good and bad, our obligations to other people, as they are perceived at a time in a geography, in a, an epoch in history. And you have to remember that most morality is the result of moralizing. And moralizing is best summed up in the following way, that a moralist is a person who says, I don't like such and such, so you are not allowed to do it. Or I don't like such and such, so you're not allowed to look at it. And moralizing tends to be restricting and narrowing, tends to try and place limitations on people, on their choices, on their behavior. And some of the, the moralities of the great traditions in the past have attempted to uh, constrain, perhaps even control, or certainly to, to govern and direct the behavior and choices of people in the mass, that is, they've applied to everybody as if there were a, a kind of one-size-fits-all answer to what a good life is. 
But a great thing that was taught by the Enlightenment of the 18th century, in fact, it wasn't a discovery of the Enlightenment, it was a rediscovery of the Enlightenment, really, was the diversity of human nature and the diversity of human talents and capabilities for living lives which are good and satisfying. For too long, too many centuries, people have been told that there is a one-size-fits-all set of beliefs about what the world is like and how one should live, and that there is a, a single overarching authority to which everybody must obey. Uh, religion and absolute monarchy were the two great forces that made people get into a queue, get into line, tow the line, so that they all behaved the same way and uh, cleave to a kind of orthodoxy. But the Enlightenment reminded people that there are many, many different ways in which lives can be good to live, many different ways of flourishing, that people have different talents and capacities for making choices, for uh, seeking something which puts meaning into their existence, and that these ways might be very different from other people's ways. This is why the Enlightenment was so interested in education, why it was so interested in literature. Think about it. However vigorous you are, however energetic, you can only live your own life and you can only have direct access to the lives of people in your community or your family, the people around you. But if you're a thoughtful reader of literature, you can see through windows, many, many windows, into many other kinds of life, many other sorts of choices and experiences. Choices and experiences that you might never confront in your own existence. And if you were a reflective reader, then you might be educated in your responses to the kinds of choices that other people make, kinds of lives that other people choose to live, even if they aren't your own, even if you wouldn't yourself choose them for yourself. But it makes you more tolerant and more understanding, more generous in your attitudes to other people. And that's why education, and especially a literary education, is so immensely valuable, because of what it does in expanding our horizons of generosity towards the great variety that there is in human possibility. And it's when people are allowed to pursue the possibilities that are accordant with their talents and their abilities that the chance for them to live in a way that is good and flourishing for them uh, arises. I'll give you one little illustration of just how informative um, a reading of literature might be, because I know you were all reading Jane Austen in the bath last night, perhaps rereading her. I used to, when I was a student, I used to go to bed with Jane Austen every Easter vacation and reread all her novels. And I found every time I reread them that there were new things to discover in them. We're all familiar with the fact that you can't really understand her novel, Emma, unless you've read it at least twice to get the irony in it. But you might have been reading, let us say, Pride and Prejudice. And you will remember the story there, which is that when the two principal characters first meet, that's Elizabeth Bennet and Darcy, the rich young man, they take a strong dislike towards one another. She thinks that he's very snobbish and standoffish. He thinks that she's very vulgar. This is because her mother is a bit vulgar, so he generalizes to the whole family. And they don't like one another to begin with, and as a result, Darcy interferes with the chances of Elizabeth's sister's happiness. Her sister falls in love with uh, uh, Darcy's friend, Mr. Bingley, and, and Darcy says, oh, you don't want to marry her. She comes from this vulgar family. And of course, Jane is made terribly unhappy by this. And so Elizabeth is resentful and angry towards Darcy. Darcy, however, sees the point of Elizabeth quite early in the novel. He recognizes that there is something rather wonderful about her. She's a very true character, a rich, a rich character in personality terms, even though her family is poor. So he falls in love with her early on, but he doesn't try anything because he knows that she doesn't like him. She sees the point of Darcy rather later on in the novel when she sees his big house in the country. Now, this is, this is not, uh, I don't mention this for reductive reasons. It wasn't because she thought, uh, oi, oi, there are a few dollars here. It was because she recognized something about him that she hadn't understood before. And that is that he'd inherited a great responsibility, a great estate, a house full of art treasures, uh, an estate with many tenant farms on it. He had a responsibility which is better understood, I suppose, in 19th century terms than in our 21st century terms, but a responsibility to pass on this great inheritance, either intact or enhanced. And in those palmy days, the way that you did it was by marrying money, and Elizabeth Bennet didn't have any. 
So when he fell in love with her, and when eventually, of course, he married her, um, it was out of love for her, her character, for the person she was. And she had come to understand something about him through the course of her experience of him and his life. Now, an attentive reader of that novel would, at the end of the novel, reflect, do I sometimes make misjudgments about other people's characters? Do I misperceive them? Do they misperceive me? How is it that we make more accurate, deeper uh, judgments about people? How can we understand others when perhaps their lives are outside the sphere of our own? And that is one of many, many results that an attentive, thoughtful reading of literature uh, has for us. If, as I say, we recognize the great value of uh, the, the opportunity to be educated and constantly to be re-educated in our thinking about how to live and in our thinking about others. So this, this point that the Enlightenment reminded us of, of the diversity of human nature and the fact that there are many kinds of good lives, immediately makes us recognize something about the ways in which the world can militate against good lives. And that is by trying to impose on all of us just one kind of answer, one doctrine, one belief about the right way to live and about what life's meaning truly is. And that's a point that I want to come back to in a moment. Now, this business about a good life and, and of making choices and of thinking about goals and aims that would infuse one's life with meaning has been a constant theme in philosophy ever since classical antiquity. I mentioned Socrates. Socrates used to go around Athens challenging his fellow Athenians to, to think about what they meant by the concepts they used when they talked about what a good life is. What did they mean by the good? What did they mean by continence and restraint, by beauty, by love, by friendship? What did they mean by these things? And his technique, you remember, was to um, get people first to realize that they really didn't understand the ideas that they were living by, and then to get them to try to think things through. He was uh, an exemplar, in a way, of the, the great challenge to think, to be reflective, to be aware, to turn the lights on, and to be conscious of the responsibility to approach life in, a, in this very conscious way. Uh, I was saying to somebody I met earlier today, uh, reminding him of something that Bertrand Russell said on this matter, that most people would rather die than think, and most people do. And what Socrates was trying to do was to get people to do a bit of thinking before they died. So the other thing you were reading in the bath last night, perhaps, was that dialogue by Plato called The Meno. You remember that story of a rich young man called Meno visiting Athens on business? And in those days, of course, there wasn't much in the way of television or baseball, so he went along to hear Socrates give a lecture that evening. And he wanted to ask Socrates a very, very important question. And that it was the burning issue of the day. And all the Greeks were worried about it at that time. And that was, is virtue teachable? Could the upstanding citizens of Thebes and Corinth and Athens, and could they pass on their sense of virtue to their children? Because their teenage children were you know, staying out late at night, drinking ouzo, getting pregnant, stealing chariots, driving them around the city walls, making a no nuisance of themselves. We can thank our lucky stars that teenagers are so different today. <laughs> and they were very, very keen to, to see whether there was some technique, something that could be done to pass on the upstanding sense of probity of the parents to the children. So men have said to, uh, to Socrates, is virtue teachable? And Socrates said, I don't know. And Menno was very surprised. What? You, the great Socrates, you don't know? How can that be? And Socrates said, because I don't know the answer to a prior question, and that is what virtue is. Menno nearly fell over. What? You don't know what virtue is? How can this be? Are you really Socrates? Socrates said, yes, I am, and I don't know what virtue is. Do you? And Menno said, of course I do. And Socrates said, oh, thank God, I've been looking for somebody all my life who knows what virtue is. And of course, you can guess what happened next, which is that uh, Menno offered a definition which Socrates demolished in a few sentences. And then Menno tried again, a bit more anxiously, and Socrates demolished that. And finally, Menno said, Socrates, you're like a stingray who stung my lips and tongue. I don't know what to say. And Socrates said, good. Now that you know that you don't know what you're talking about, we can begin to make progress. 
Now, I always tell this story to my students because it's very reassuring to them. The message, of course, there is that confusion is the beginning of wisdom. So I say to my students, if you're confused, you're on the right path. <laughs> and this is exactly what Socrates did to his fellows in Greek society at the time to force them to think. First, to make them realize that they didn't really know what they uh, believed. They, didn't, they were using these words, using these terms, but they didn't really understand it. He was forcing them to challenge their assumptions. Now, this is something that I do um, fo following on Socrates' uh, wonderful lead with my students also. I say to them, if you were able to resurrect Isaac Newton and ask him why he thought what he did about gravity. Now, I always preface this story that having been educated uh, at uh, Oxford University and having taught at Oxford University for a long time, uh, I know that everybody's heard of Oxford University, and so I asked them if they've ever heard of that other place, <laughs> uh, Cambridge. And I, I point out to them that uh, Oxford people always find it very strange about Cambridge people that they think that what happens in Cambridge applies to the entire universe. Now, this is the case of Newton. He was sitting under a tree in a damp meadow near Cambridge when an apple fell on his head. And when he looked up in the sky, he saw the moon. It was broad daylight, but the moon was visible. And he asked himself the question, why doesn't the moon fall to the earth? And thereby began his reflections, which led to the inverse square law of gravitation. In fact, of course, the story of the apple is a very romantic story because the apple was attracted to the earth and the earth to the apple. So there was a, no doubt there were violins playing in the background. But li like a good Cambridge man, Newton, when he saw this uh, happening in Cambridge, he applied it to the whole universe. So I say to my students, if you could meet Newton now, you could ask him that question. Why does the principle of gravity apply to the whole universe and not just to Cambridge? What would he answer? And Newton would answer, the same laws apply everywhere in the universe because the universe is the same everywhere. Now, of course, this is something that we know, or rather suspect, is no longer the case. We know that the laws of nature tend to break down on the event horizon of a black hole. They certainly don't apply at a singularity like the Big Bang and so on. So we now think rather differently, and perhaps there are many universes, and perhaps the, the constants as we think of them in this universe don't apply in other universes. Well... That assumption that uh, uh, Newton made um, was tremendously important to the development of classical physics. He had to assume that the universe is the same everywhere and that space and time are continua, are, are absolutes. So I say to my students, would you press that question? You, oh Isaac, think that the universe is the same everywhere. Why do you think that? What would he answer? Well, he would answer as follows, because he does answer in the Principia. He says, the universe is the same everywhere because it was created by God and God is an economical workman. Now I point out to my students that there are at least three assumptions there. That there is a God, that she created the universe, And that she's an economical workman. That is, that she would make the same laws everywhere. I mean, if you have the whole of eternity, why not entertain yourself with different laws in different places and so on? So these are three big assumptions. And what's surprising about them, and of course they're independently debatable assumptions, but what's surprising is that they lie in the very foundations of classical Newtonian physics. And they are not themselves physical assumptions. They're not physically motivated, and they're not physically testable but they are essential to the structure of Newtonian thought. And this is something that ought to be surprising. I mean, one thing that philosophy does is to ask people to look at the assumptions, to look at the framework of thinking. And so often when we do that, we find very surprising ideas, just like those ideas in Newton's physics, that ideas that we don't know are there if we don't look for them. Now, what Socrates was trying to do was he was trying to get people to realize that they were making assumptions, to unearth those assumptions, to dig them up, and to look at them. Some of the assumptions that we make, of course, might stand the test of scrutiny, but others might not. Other ways of thinking about things might occur to us, and we might suddenly realize that among the reasons why it is difficult to be the liver of a good and satisfying and flourishing life is because there are structural features of our societies, assumptions we make, things that we build into our moral systems that are inimical 
to the chance of human flourishing. And this is something that any society, any group of people, and certainly any individual, should do on a pretty regular basis. Unearth those assumptions, challenge them, look at them, uh, challenge one's own most cherished beliefs, the things that one thinks and believes because they give one comfort and security. One should really ask, is this right? Is this defensible? Is this a way of thinking that can stand up to hard uh, examination? And what Socrates wanted to do is to get people to examine things in that way. Well, we can fast forward through the centuries uh, to uh, um, a much more recent thinker, Albert Camus. One must always uh, mention a Frenchman when one's talking a bit of philosophy, uh, because the French uh, like their philosophy. By the way, I can open a little footnote here for you. And, and another thing that I, whenever the French uh, come into the picture, I'm, I'm reminded of uh, today's um, best-known French philosopher. He's a man called Bernard-Henri Lévy. Have you heard of him? a man with a magnificent hairstyle. <coughs> There's no necessity, by the way, for magnificent hairstyles in um, philosophy, but he has one. <laughs> he rather famously uh, also wears shirts with plunging décolletage. <laughs> he, has a, he has these shirts made for big collars and the plunging décolletage. And I asked him one day, I said to him, why, why do you wear your shirt open to your belly button? <laughs> and he said, uh, because I'm hot. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Just recently, he published a book in which he quoted a very, very little known, in fact, an unknown French philosopher of the 18th century by the name of Botul, B-O-T-U-L. And uh, after the book was published and it was up on the, on the shelves, somebody pointed out to him that this person, Botul, doesn't exist. He was made up by a joker on the internet. The internet's full of misinformation like this. And Bernard had not checked that this was the case. He would have checked if he had noticed that the, the philosophy of Botul is known as Botulism. <laughs> and in very, in very good French style, when he was asked on television, how could he possibly quote somebody from the internet without checking up on it? How could he do it? He said, oh, you know, what he says is good, so I quote him. <laughs> This is a, a typical example of the French attitude, which is, well, it works in practice, but does it work in theory? This is the really essential question. They're, they're a philosophical nation, and uh, they have produced some thinkers who are of great significance to us in, in our discussion, our conversation about our topic, which is the good and well-lived life. And one of them is Albert Camus. And the other thing you were reading in the bath last night, because you were very busy there, I can see, was his essay, The Myth of Sisyphus. And you may remember, you remember the myth of Sisyphus, this uh, individual Sisyphus in Greek mythology, somebody who had angered the gods, and as his punishment, he was uh, forced to roll a great rock up a hill, but he would never reach the top, because just as he was about to, the rock would roll down again, and he would have to start all over again. And he was condemned to do this for eternity. And a question which arises about the existence of Sisyphus suffering this punishment is, is it possible for Sisyphus to have a life that's meaningful? Could he, could he have an existence which has some value to him, despite being condemned to this endless repetition of this task? And this is the question that Camus addresses in this essay. And he begins in a very striking way. He says, that the great philosophical question is, should I or should I not commit suicide? Because if the answer is no, then there is a reason to live. And that reason is the thing that gives meaning to your life. Of course, if the reason is that you're too frightened to commit suicide, or scared of what might happen afterwards, or that it would be too painful to do it, then that's not a particularly good reason. That's just living, living out of timidity. But if there were something you wanted to do or to see, or some sense of obligation you have, some, some exercise of love towards people you really care about, something you want to learn, if there are those sorts of reasons for going on to live, then amongst them will be the things that give meaning to your existence. This is a really, really important point, this. I mean, very often I'm asked by cab drivers in London what I do. I tell them there's a pause because they think, what does a philosopher do when he gets up in the morning? And does, he, does he do this? You know? <laughs> the answer is yes, by the way. That's just my 
But then they always say, after the pause, they say, so what's the meaning of life then? <laughs> and I say to them, I know the answer to that question. And I don't tell them, because I make them stew for a little bit. They say, well, go on then, what, what is it, what is it? And I say, it's what you make it of your life. The meaning of life is the meaning of your life, of what you choose, of what goals, of what, of what movement towards something of significance to you, you can make in your life. And that, of course, is the point that Camus was making, and it is a point that Socrates was making. Because Socrates, when he was um, challenged to give some account of what it was he was seeking when he asked people to find the essence or provide the definition of some moral concept or other, would always respond by pointing out that the really significant thing is choice, is, is living a life that is considered and which is your own. He put the point by saying the unconsidered life is not worth living. Because if you haven't thought about it, you haven't thought about yourself and you, the talent that you have to live well in your way and in a way which uh, relates to, to other people well, always remembering, by the way, that at the very heart of good lives, of good relationships, we are social animals. We need to love and to give and to receive love and to be in our community. So to think about who we care about and, and what we do in our fellowship with other people, what we what we find in the way of the gifts that we can give and can receive from others. These things are things of choice once we've begun to think about them and once we've begun to challenge oneself about the things that we haven't chosen but just adopted because we were born into a given community or born into a place and time which has those cultural outlooks. So Socrates said the unconsidered life is not worth living because that life is a life chosen by other people. You're a football in their football match. You're going in the direction that they kick you, not the direction that you've chosen to go in. Now, of course, that is a, um, what's sometimes called a council of perfection. We find ourselves in a whole network of relationships and laws and social requirements and the need to get a job and you know, all the things that place constraints on us so we're not completely free agents. Everybody here could, could you know, tear off his or her clothes and run down the street screaming, you're free to do that, but you're not really free to do it because when you think about the consequences, it's very constraining. So there are many constraints on us, but at the very heart of our lives, there are spaces of freedom which are such that our choices there can make a great difference to how we live and what we feel. And it's in that sense that Socrates was talking about the considered life, the life really reflected on, and the life where very fundamental choices uh, are made. So that's what I mean in talking about the good and flourishing life, the life of achievement. That's what I mean. That is the, 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 the spark um, of, of Socrates' challenge to us to, to think in those ways. And when you move on past uh, Socrates' uh, um, pupil Plato, a great genius, but a most appalling fascist. You wouldn't want to live in the state that, Socrates, that uh, Plato dreamt up in the Republic. There's only one thing that Plato said in connection with his ideal utopian state uh, that I agree with, and that is that philosophers should rule the world. <laughs> but otherwise, uh, the things that he has to say, you know, all children being brought up in common, a eugenics program in which the rulers choose who can have children, dividing the society into th the three classes of philosopher kings, as I say, that's okay, uh, the guardians and then the ordinary people. I mean, that, that kind of state, which you can read about in, in the Republic, would be utterly unacceptable. Rather, it is Plato's pupil, Aristotle, in the first great work of discussion of ethics in the history of, of Western culture, uh, where you, this idea of, um, of uh, uh, a flourishing life is first fully worked out. Now, you were reading the Nicomachean Ethics in the Bath last night, so you remember what he says there about the fact that that life is the life that is going to result from reflection, from consideration, from making a choice, from using our intellects, from thinking. The thinking that Socrates and much later on Bertrand Russell said is at the very root of the possibility of choices. So there is no one-size-fits-all prescription here. There is a, an invitation or challenge to think about and to make choices about a life consonant with your, your own talents. And we've all of us got 
talents and capacities, and these talents and capacities would be widely different from those of other people, perhaps, but a way of living, a way of giving, a way of relating to other people, a way that produces this uh, phenomenon that Aristotle called eudaimonia, the idea of well-being and well-doing, of moving towards worthwhile goals, that idea. And it will be a very, very uh, a varied idea. It will be an idea that each one of us should be able to recognize for ourselves and make a case for. And that's an important point also. Because supposing after uh, several weekends of deep reflection you decided that you have a, a talent for murder, well then, and you said this to your neighbors, you said, well, I've decided I'm going to live the eudaimonic life in Aristotle's sense by murdering people. Then your neighbors would say to you, hang on a second, have you, can, ha, could you really make a case for that? Could you really persuade other people that this was something that they should give you the space and the opportunity to do, allow you your chance of a good life in that kind of way. And of course the answer is going to be no, because a, a, a life premised on harm to others cannot be a good life. Indeed, nobody could think that their life, uh, no, no, nobody could think that his or her life is a, a good and satisfying life, which ignores completely the fact that elsewhere in the world there are people living in great unhappiness or deprivation in places of conflict and struggle. Every one of us has some responsibility to be alert to the fact that we're part of a great family on this planet and that if each of us did just a little bit uh, to help others, then it would make uh, a difference. My friend and colleague, uh, Peter Singer, has written a rather remarkable book on this question about the, the way that people can make a difference if without harming their own projects in life, they were to share just a little bit of their resources with others. And it just makes, it's, a, it's a, an irrefutable argument. And it's an argument that bears on oneself. Because if one deliberately shuts one's eyes to these responsibilities, then one isn't being as reflective as one should be in order to live the life that is good to live. So that's what I mean by a good life. What do I mean by a bad world? Well, there is one very obvious way in which the world can be bad sometimes, and there is an unobvious way in which the world is too often bad. The obvious way has to do with uh, those uh, natural evils that we all face, uh, aging and disease. By the way, Oscar Wilde, the great philosopher, um, said uh, that the tragedy of aging is that we are all young. Um, aging, disease, uh, natural disasters, tsunamis, um, all, all the familiar natural evils. And then, of course, the, uh, the evils that arise out of hatreds between people, tensions between them, differences of belief and outlook, uh, competitions over resources. Uh, we see around us in the world crime, we see terrorism, we see uh, civil war, we see um, all sorts of, of horrors that interrupt the lives and chances and possibilities of far, far too many people around the planet. And this is a perennial story. It seems to us to be a, a great burden on history, the amount of human suffering there is as a result of these differences and these conflicts. But I do have to point one thing out about them which is good to remember, and that is the reason why our newspapers are full of stories of, of uh, uh, atrocity and terrorism and crime and, and conflict and war, the reason why they're full of, of stories about these things is because these things are news. That the vast majority of human interactions, every minute of every hour of every day, in every village or town or city in the world, is generally speaking a story of cooperation and ordinary civility and kindness. That the, 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 the great majority of human interactions are good interactions. You have only to look around any city to see the results of cooperation. Buildings and sewerage systems and public transport systems and docks and airports. These are all the results of cooperation, of people keeping their promises, of doing what's expected of them. So the majority story uh, uh, of, uh, about humanity is rather a good story. And that's why the conflicts and the bad things are in the newspapers. Because if the newspaper headlines, if the Straits Times said, you know, so-and-so said hello to so-and-so this morning, <laughs> well, that wouldn't be news, or it certainly wouldn't be very interesting news. And yet, by far, it is uh, the most common human interaction. So the world is, a, is a, a, a bad place because of these conflicts. And these conflicts around the world impact on all of us. But fortunately, they are not the 
the main item when it comes to how humanity ex experiences itself. So we're familiar with all those reasons for the world being bad, but we are not so familiar with other reasons why it might be mad, ba bad. And there are, there are two examples that I want to draw on. One of them is the negative aspects of uh, religion in our world. And the second is um, the, the, the way, and it's not unrelated to uh, outlooks and systems of belief, but the, the, the way that we try to, that our societies historically have tried to regulate human interaction. I'll give you one example. In the United Kingdom, until uh, the late 1960s, homosexuality was illegal. If two, two people of the same sex loved one another, it was the male sex because uh, uh, female homosexu uh, homosexuality was not illegal, but if two men loved one another and expressed their affection for one another, they could be locked up in prison for it. When uh, homosexuality was decriminalized, there was still, of course, a great deal of social opprobrium. People regarded uh, homosexuals as being uh, perverted in their um, desires and, and uh, ad actions, uh, and it took some decades before society became more generous, more humane in its outlook towards uh, gay people and more accepting of them. And it's still, of course, a, a metropolitan phenomenon. It's mainly in the big cities of the, of the Western world where uh, gay culture now flourishes openly and where people, uh, gay people can express their affection for one another uh, openly. In my view, this is a, a, a very good thing. Uh, I'm not myself a, a gay person, but I feel tremendous sympathy for anybody whose natural expression of uh, affection for another person is constrained by criminal laws. It seems a kind of madness that that should be so. But that is an example, that's an example of how a society can come to have beliefs and to put into place uh, uh, principles based uh, on those beliefs, legal principles, as well as uh, the very coercive power of social disapproval, um, which so interrupt the possibilities for happiness of uh, a minority of people in the society as to be sources of genuine misery and concern. And when one starts to do what one did with Newton and to look at some of the assumptions and to understand why these things happen, uh, some very surprising results come. Take the case of homosexuality. If you look at uh, non-Judeo-Christian non societies, look, for example, at uh, classical antiquity in, in Greece and in Persia, and other places, um, homosexuality was regarded as normal and acceptable, and in fact, in some ways, encouraged. It was encouraged in, in the, the Greek world because it was thought that uh, uh, an older lover and a younger lover were able to um, have a kind of a master-apprentice relationship in which the younger would learn something about society and responsibilities and some of the military arts. Uh, and it was a, a recognized part of a pattern, a social pattern. It was regulated to some extent. It wasn't just a, a free-for-all, but it had its place. And some of the great legends and stories that we learn from uh, classical antiquity, like the relationship between Achilles and Patroclus, between Nisus and Euryalus and others, these models of friendship were based on um, homosexual as well, as well as homosocial relations. But in the Judeo-Christian tradition, things have been very different. Why? Well, here's the reason. That the Jewish peoples in their very early history were herding peoples. The sheep and the goats, their flocks of sheep and goats, mattered hugely to them because it was an existential question whether or not the flocks themselves flourished and grew. Wealth was based on the size of the herd, the clothing, the, the, the food, the life, the very existence of the tribes depended upon the flocks. And it was therefore crucial that the seed of the male should go to the egg of the female. And so long as the seed of the male went to the egg of the female, there was no problem because the chance of, of reproduction was always there. Read your Old Testament and you will see that the patriarchs and the prophets had many wives, many concubines, many uh, children by slave girls. Abraham did. Solomon had a thousand wives. There was no great problem about it. David, who is a, a significant figure in, um, in the Bible story, uh, misbehaved himself very frequently. Do you remember the story about Bathsheba, whom he saw bathing on her rooftop? And he took a fancy to her, so he sent her husband off to the wars and told somebody to put him in the front line so he wouldn't come back. And then he seduced Bathsheba. 
I remember, again, with the London taxi driver, they're always very uh, good value. I asked him, <laughs> I asked one of them once if he had read the Old Testament, and he said no. And I said, do you remember any stories from the Old Testament? He said, uh, I thought for a moment, he said, I remember a story about a woman being turned into a pillar of salt. And I thought this was indicative of the fact that he had quarreled with his wife that morning. It was wishful thinking. <laughs> and I said, do you know where that story comes from? He said, no. I said, well, it comes from the story of Sodom. You know, when God saw what was happening in Sodom, he didn't like it, so he decided to wipe everybody out. This is a fairly usual practice in the Old Testament to do this. Uh, and he was reminded that there might be a righteous person in Sodom, as indeed there was. It was Lot. And uh, so God said, oh, well, in that case, I'll send some angels down to tell him to get out of town before I, I, I nuke the place. So the angels went down. And, of course, the angels were rather good-looking, you know, like rather good-looking young men. So the citizens of Sodom wanted him when they saw him. And they chased after them through the streets and they got to Lot's house and banged on his door. And they said, give us those two young men. And Lot said, no, you can't. They're my guests. He said, I've got two virgin daughters here. You can have them if you like and do what you like to them. He says that in there. That's what it says. And they said, no, no, we don't want girls. Give us those two young men. But fortunately, before uh, any further horrors occurred, they managed to escape from the city. Lot's wife turned around when the explosion happened and she was turned to a pillar of salt. But Lot and his daughters got up into the mountains. And while they were there, you may remember, so we've already had sodomy and uh, the offering of virgin daughters and um, genocide, okay, mass murder. Now we've got into them and murder of Lot's wife. We've now got to the mountains and Lot's daughters are a bit fed up because they haven't got husbands. So what do they do? They plan with one another to make their father drunk and sleep with him. And the result is that they were the ancestresses of the Moabites and the Amalekites, two of the tribes of Palestine. Incest as well, okay? So the taxi driver said to me, is that in the Bible? He said. <laughs> I said, I'm afraid so. And he said, surely they cut it out. Said, <laughs> well, you notice that none of that is any problem. The, the problem in that story was the seed of the male going not to the egg of the female. That was the really crucial thing there, and that was what was caused the destruction of, of Sodom. It didn't matter about Lot and his daughters or anything else. And so that was the reason why homosexuality was, was regarded as anathema in the Old Testament. And it says in Leviticus, you must stone uh, gay men to death because their seed is going on the ground or not, not going to the egg of the female. If it goes to the egg of the female, it doesn't matter. You can do anything. And this is the reason why, at one point in the history of moral theology in the Christian religion, masturbation was regarded as worse than rape because at least rape can result in reproduction. Now, that's twisted thinking, in my uh, humble opinion. And it's the result of, of a tradition of thought which nobody examines. They never ask the question, why, why is it wrong? Uh, why is homosexual activity wrong? Well, because it can't result in uh, more goats and sheep. It's really, really the ultimate answer from the Old Testament. And so now, when we, we look now, and we're just looking for one generation back, back to the late 1960s in the UK when homosexual activity was decriminalized. After so many centuries, ethical reflection on the rights and wrongs and the reasons has resulted in a moral change. Moralities change when people think, begin to think differently and put different arguments and say, it's, it's, it's not right, it's not in the interests of human beings, it doesn't go with the grain of human nature, that we should restrain and, and control and impose and criminalize and try to force people into a mold, try to make everybody the same, and go against things that, uh, that uh, are in themselves are actually harmless. And this is a, a very, very good example of how the world can be a bad place for what I suppose many people thought were good reasons. Let's stamp out homosexuality. Homosexuality is unnatural. We've got to stamp it out, criminalize it, lock people up who do it so they can't taint other people. And these sorts of... of, of uh, uh, um, ways of thinking are ways that make the world a bad place because they are based on bad assumptions and they're not thought through and they're not challenged. Another example is uh, um, religion. Now, I want to acknowledge straight away that uh, religious commitment, sincerely held by, by people who have a deep faith, a deep sense of belonging to their religious community and their religious traditions, can bring an enormous amount of psychological support 
a great richness, a great cultural richness with it. There's wonderful music and art which is associated with religious practice. But as a view of the world and as a reason for organizing society in one way rather than another, as a justification for trying to impose uh, this one-size-fits-all model I've been talking about on the great diversity and plurality of human nature, religion has throughout history been a source of great suffering and of great conflict in our world. And when we stop and think a little bit about the nature of uh, religion and where it arises from and why it persists, we notice two things. We notice that if you leave aside all the questions about the teachings of great prophets like uh, uh, Jesus or Muhammad, if we leave aside the traditions that have grown from them and we go back before we even begin to think that there might be gods and goddesses uh, in the universe or associated with some way, just ask ourselves the question, where does uh, religious belief come from and why does it persist? Those two questions. We come up with some surprising and, uh, and subversive answers. Our best understanding of the roots of religion, and we've got very good evidence for reconstructing this picture in this way, comes from the mythologies that we know about in the world and from the existence of Stone Age societies which are contemporary with us. And we can, we can do a kind of Nietzschean genealogy of the growth of religious um, belief by uh, noticing how animistic those early mythologies are and how um, much uh, Stone Age culture is animistic in its outlook. So our earliest ancestors, when they were trying to make sense of the world around them and how the world works, had one concept that they could use to explain things. And that was the concept of agency. From their own felt capacity as agents, pick up a stone, throw it into the pond, makes a splash, it causes ripples in the water. That's something that I did because I acted. The word agent and the word actor come from the same root in Latin, ego agere acti actum. You were all doing your Latin vocabulary in the bath last night as well, so you remember that. So agency, being able to do something, make a difference to the world. So the wind, the thunder, the, the rain, the lightning, the, the growth of plants, th these must be the results of agency. There must be something making it happen. You look at mythologies, you notice that in Greek mythology, for example, the nymphs and dryads were right there in the streams, in the trees. It was a god of the winds. Zeus was a thunder god. Poseidon, the god of the sea, caused the earthquakes and the movement of the tides. These were personifications of agencies. And then you will notice, as you look at history, that these agencies in nature that make nature work and provide us with an explanation, the more our ancestors came to understand nature, the world, the more these agencies moved away. First they went to mountaintops. Zeus and the Olympians lived on top of Mount Olympus. Moses met God on a mountaintop in the form of a burning bush and a pillar of smoke by day was probably a volcano god. They were up to the mountaintops to regard it as, as sacred. Those of you who have a Chinese heritage will know that mountaintops are very sacred because ghosts who can only travel in straight lines don't want to meet one another at mountaintops, so they're safe places to be. So mountaintops have this kind of hallowed nature. But when we, or our ancestors, got to the tops of mountains, you can imagine, you know, peering over the top of the mountain, there were no gods there. Where did they go? Into the sky. Where are they now? Now that we know that no way is up. Because you know, gods used to ascend into heaven, and now there's no way you can ascend because the sky is everywhere. They're beyond space and time. So through history, the gods have gone further and further away, always just over the horizon of our ignorance, <laughs> until finally they vanished altogether. And now when you try to talk to a theologian, you would say, oh, well, our finite minds are incapable of understanding the nature of deity. And of course, that is the last great excuse. So there's nothing to discuss if you can't discuss it. And yet, the forms of religion remain. Now, why is that the case? Well, I imagine that among those ancestors who are thinking about these agencies, some of them must have eaten a magic mushroom or consumed some, <laughs> some fermented grains without realizing it, or had an epileptic fit or a nightmare, or somebody banged them on the head with a stone. And they had some altered state of consciousness in which they thought they'd encountered these agencies. And when they woke up again afterwards, they said, Whoa, wow, I've, I've met the gods. Actually, personally, I think it was some bloke, it's usually some bloke, who thought to himself, if I can persuade 
the fe my fellows in this tribe that I can speak to these agencies and perhaps influence their behavior, then I'm going to get all the money and the girls. <laughs> and that's probably how some religion did start. And the temporal powers, of course, have found um, the religions of great value because if you, if you can persuade people that they are watched all the time by an invisible policeman, even when they're on their own in bed at night, then, and they are going to you know, be rewarded or punished for what they do, then you have a, a, a tremendous system of influence over people's behavior. You know what they say about Bernie Madoff, the Ponzo scheme person in New York, that his big mistake was to promise rewards in this life. <laughs> and that's more or less how the religions operate. And of course, <laughs> you're, never, you're never in a position to uh, uh, to, to get called out on, on the, the, the uh, promises of reward or the threats of punishment, uh, given that uh, you have to do something to find out, and that's die before, before you can. So, so that might be a, a, an explanation, a very plausible explanation of the origin of religion. The psychological thing is, of course, that the vast majority of people, the vast majority of people, um, have the religion they do because their parents did because they were born into that religion. Now, small children are, for good evolutionary reasons, very credulous. They have to believe what the adults in their circle tell them. Fire burns, you mustn't go too close to the edge of the cliff, and so on, because it's an evolutionary matter. So when they're very little, they believe everything. Of course, when they become teenagers, they don't believe anything that the adults <laughs> tell them. This is why they say, if you have teenage children, you must also have a dog, because then somebody's happy to see you when you come home. <laughs> but small children are very credulous, so they believe all this. They believe Father Christmas and the Tooth Fairy and, and, and so on. And those things are not socially reinforced after about the age of 10 or 11, but religion is. Everywhere you look, there's a church, there's a temple, there's a mosque, there's a synagogue. Uh, you know, it's men, always men, isn't it, at the head of religious organizations who are um, present at great public occasions. So there's massive social reinforcement. There are great religious festivals. Today is a religious festival. And this, this makes people think there's something in it. There must be something in it. Now, there's a kind of trajectory. Little children believe all these stories. They get to the courting age, you know, teenage, young adulthood, when religion really does interfere with your sex life, so belief tends to fall away a little bit. <laughs> then, uh, you know, your grandparents die, then your parents die, then you lose your job, then, you know, bad things happen in life. So what do you do? You go back to the beliefs of your childhood for comfort, for succor. And if you were to go, for example, to a church or to some religious community, you'd be welcomed by nice people. And you will feel all the benefits that a religious organization offers people, which is a sense of community and a sense of uh, shared purpose. And that is a great psychological support. And people transfer that to the belief, as if it was the belief that's doing the work and not the fact that they have friends. I think the, the, uh, the evidence about la late reconversions or returns to, to religion suggests that it doesn't stick for very long. There's another trajectory there. That people go back to the religion of their childhood. That stays for a little while. Then, of course, they're more reflective about the things that they're expected to believe and the things they say when they pray and so on. So it tends to fade away, and people move into what I call the feng shui tendency, crystals and reorganizing their furniture and so on. And even that tends to fade away after a little while. So there, again, there's this kind of graph you could draw about how people actually practice their belief. But the vast majority of people who have a religious belief are a la carte about their belief. If you read the documents of any religion, there are going to be plenty of things in there that you don't like and don't want to do. And so you just ignore them. You cherry pick the bits that you can do and not too interrupting of your life. I mean, think about those of you who are Christians or have a Christian tradition, you go back and look at the New Testament and you will notice that everything it says in the New Testament about the ethical life, which it shares with other ethical outlooks, religious and non-religious, love your neighbor like Mozi said, or the Buddha who was very compassionate, uh, look after the widows and orphans. These are ethical tenets that all ethical outlooks share. But what's special about Christianity? Give away everything you own. Make no plans for tomorrow. If your family disagree with you, and they will if you give away all your money, uh, turn your back on them. Don't marry. 
These are un completely unlivable ethical tenets. Why are they there? Well, because the early Christians very sincerely believed that they lived at the end of history, that the Messiah was going to come back next week, next month, next year, but soon. You've got to be like the wise virgins. You've got to keep the, the wicks of your lamps trimmed. It's the end, we, at the end of time, of course you don't need money. It gets in the way. You're not going to marry. You're not going to have children and need no plans. So this was the sincere belief of the early Christians. Now, three or four centuries went by. They were all looking at their sundials and nothing had happened. <laughs> what did they do? They imported into their uh, system a lot of ancient Greek philosophy. A lot of what people think of as Christian morality is actually Stoicism and Epicureanism and, and the teachings of the secular Greek philosophers because the church needed a richer view. As a matter of interest, they also imported the idea of the immortal soul. You have to remember that uh, the early Christians were of the Jewish tradition. They believed that when you died, your body was buried in the ground, and there it stayed until the Messiah came. Then the graves would open and you would come out. St. Paul says that uh, when the graves open, you come out with a new body. I like that bit. I want a six-pack and a tan and everything. <laughs> uh, but he also said that the saints will see no corruption. They won't rot in the graves. And when some centuries later, uh, saints were moved to the churches as relics, they were found to have rotted, and there were nothing left but bones. And so something else was brought from Greek philosophy, the idea of the immortal soul. This is something that came several centuries into the Christian story. And when you know these things, when you know about the history of religions, and then you ask yourself the question, how is it that uh, um, so much structure has been um, placed into society on the basis of these beliefs and traditions? So many people have been obliged to live their lives, even with the threat of death if they didn't, if they didn't accept these beliefs and these practices, that people were not allowed to question the assumptions and to think afresh and to think for themselves. You can see how much of history and how many of our fellows in the human story haven't been given the opportunity that so many of us have now in our world, in most parts of the world, to be truly responders to the Socratic challenge, to think for ourselves. So the world can be a bad place for good reasons, for reasons that people think are good reasons. People who are earnest about morality, who want us, you know, people who want you to get into heaven and therefore they want you to stop doing what you want to do and tell you how to behave. I mean, think back to the Inquisition. The reason why people were burned at the stake was because the church was being kind to them. Seems a bit paradoxical, but think about it. If, if I can kill you now, then you're not going to keep on sinning, so I'm saving you a few million years in purgatory. So I'm doing you a favor. Uh, and th this is what moralists and religious leaders always want to do. They want to do you a favor by stopping you from enjoying yourself mainly, which is, or, or of living your life your way. If only you would live your life their way, you would be okay. And they would be satisfied because they've, they've uh, responded to their own sense of mission. So that is a way that the world can be uh, inimical to the good and well-lived life, providing that the good and well-lived life is one which is honestly and sincerely chosen and for which a case can be made and which is directed towards good relationships, kindness to others, and flourishing for oneself. So as you see, there is no, there is no single prescription. There is only an invitation and a challenge. And that invitation and challenge comes very, very, very well from uh, the humanist tradition, which says one thing about the basis of our ethics. It says, try to choose and to live on the basis of your best, most generous, most sympathetic understanding of your fellow human beings in all their variety. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Grayling, and uh, I didn't have the heart to stop you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. But we do have a little time. I know that uh, it's limited because we do have to clear out of the room uh, maybe in uh, f maybe less than 15 minutes. Uh, let's okay. plunge in. Uh, of course, I think I myself, for example, would have many things to, to ask and so on. But 
let's, let's start with the first question. Yes. And, well, there are a number of hands. Uh, could I just uh, be fair? Uh, there's one there, one there, and one here. Let's take maybe a couple of questions for a start. Uh, and could you first uh, quickly identify yourself, and could you keep your question as short as possible? <laughs> All right, so that we can have a fair round. Yes, sir. Sorry, sorry. Uh, the, well, the two persons asking questions at the same time. It's up there. And is there a mic for this man? Uh, okay, go ahead and be quick. Yeah. Thank you. Could I take that? Uh, thank yeah. you. It's a good question because it's the, uh, the, the great problem of a liberal society to be tolerant of the intolerant. Then the intolerant grow up in the midst of that society and can easily enough uh, cause huge problems for it or even indeed overthrow it. You know, the idea um, sometimes uh, that liberalism results in one man, one vote, one time, you know, and then you've, you've got the intolerant in charge. So it, it is a great difficulty. And I think there does come a point where um, one has to uh, fight back, I think, against intolerance and make this demand that if we're going to, to tolerate differences and tolerate other opinions, then those other opinions have to tolerate in return. And one really key thing about tolerance is toler tolerating um, offense. That the idea of offending somebody because of their beliefs or appearance or looks or uh, political um, affiliations is something that we should deal with very carefully. I think, I think to to be uh, offensive to people in, because they have a disability or because of their age or because of their race or because of their sexuality or because of their gender, I think that's unacceptable. But things that people can change, even if it's very difficult, like their political affiliation or their religion uh, or, or the, their fashion sense, those are things that we should be able to offend people on because it gets them to think. Thank you. Thank you. The answer emphatically is yes. And indeed, uh, uh, th th there is very good reason for, for saying that, which is that uh, in the UK, there's an organization, it's known as the Philosophy Shop, the Philosophy Foundation, which uh, introduces philosophy to young children in schools right from the age of six or seven onwards. The aim being to help them to think. After all, the great aim of education should be to teach people how to think, not what to think. That's the big mistake that uh, too often made. Uh, and these uh, very young children are very good at philosophy. It comes naturally to them. You know, you take one of those ring donuts and you ask them about the hole in the middle and you say, when you've eaten this donut, where is the hole? And they're very, very good in their answers. I'll challenge anybody in this room to tell me what happens to the hole when you eat a donut. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, was there a question in front? Yes, please. Yeah. And let's try and keep this question succinct. Yeah. Okay, uh, in your opinion, um, do all current societies um, fulfill the minimum condition, or the sufficient or necessary conditions for people living in the society to live a good life? All societies. That's my question. I'm not entirely clear the, the question you're, you're asking, but if, if I were to, to specify a, a, a condition or set of conditions, they would be the ones implicit in ideas of, of human rights and civil liberties, which if you reflect on them, are all aimed at trying to open up a space around the individual 
so that an individual can, if they have the energy and the, and, and, and the determination, can do something with their own abilities and talents. Of course, if a society is a very unequal one, that there's a great deal of structural unfairness so that too many people can't exercise their, their talents and, and uh, um, find a way of, of, of living which is flourishing for them, then that's an unjust society and that, that has to be rectified. This is why Aristotle said that his writings on ethics were continuous with his writings on politics because political principles should be uh, very, very sensitive to the need to allow individuals to have that, that good life. But providing other things are equal, and they're not in the world, providing they are, then the idea is there must be a space around the individual for that action. Next, please. Uh, um, I have a mic up here. Hang, hang on now. Sorry, where are you? Up here, right up here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank Can you. Can we have that? Then we'll go to the gentleman who has raised his hand. And one more at the corner. In that order, please. Yes. Thank you. Um, Professor, you mentioned earlier that m wanting to murder your neighbor was uh, to be discouraged. Um, <clears throat> I'll say. Now, surely that cannot be the case because um, two things. One is, for example, half the males in, in this room have been trained to do great harm to other people, and I'm speaking of uh, military service, um, th there is, there is a, a direction that people with these um, desires can be, uh, they can be directed some, some place, right? In countries that are actually at war, um, the people who are at the top obviously are very good at doing great harm to other people, and they are rewarded by the society for that. So my question to you is, all of us have slightly... Uh, evil desires, you know, maybe not as bad as murder, but we all have... Could you get to your question, please? So that's the question, right? Um, are these desires to be discouraged, or are they to be acted on because we have them? Thank you. Okay, um, well, speak for yourself on the, uh, on the evil <laughs> desires <laughs> question. Um, we, we, we do, of course, have rugby and boxing and various other ways of dealing with some of the more aggressive impulses that the male of the species uh, tends to have at a certain phase in, in life. Um, uh, training people to, to kill other people, well, uh, th th this is one of the tragic necessities of a world of conflict. I'm not myself a, a complete pacifist, but I am very anti-war and very, very anti-guns. In fact, it, it uh, shocks and astonishes me how many small arms there are, Kalashnikovs and the rest, that absolutely anybody who wants them seems to be able to get hold of them, and they are the one of the the um, uh, sources, in a way, of the spread of conflicts in our world because somebody is making millions and millions and millions out of selling guns to other people and causing great harm thereby. But um, societies do have to defend themselves against aggression, so I suppose people do need to be trained in the, in the arts of defense. The First World War showed that conscript armies have only about 20% effectives in them, that is, the people who actually will shoot at the enemy when they're told to. Uh, so that says something about human nature, which is on the more promising side of your remark. I accept that uh, there are things about us, aspects of human nature, which are um, very undesirable. Aggression, anger, the capacity to hate, the very unfortunate capacity we have to divide ourselves into tribes, and the other tribes are the bad ones, and ours is the good one. And that is a, a root cause of a great deal of conflict in the world. But it seems to me that bit by bit we are overcoming it. And here I recommend to you um, that book, The Better Angels of Our Nature by Stephen Pinker, another friend and colleague of mine, uh, who um, has shown us that despite everything and despite the terrible wars of the 20th century, the world is actually getting a better place from that point of view, the point of view that you mentioned. Sir? Yes, please. Uh. Yeah, just taking up this point that you made about the, uh, the, the, the importance of seeking meaning in life rather than seeking the meaning of life, which I think probably makes you an existentialist, I don't know, but isn't the problem that there's a fundamental conflict between trying to seek meaning on a, an individual level as opposed to seeking meaning on a sort of a, the level of society or nation state? For instance, um, religion's a good example because uh, if religion was confined to the individual, then that would be fine, but once it becomes a, a social or a nation state ethic, then uh, it, it becomes problematic. Thank you. Just wondering what you thought about that. Yes, I, I do agree with that. I mean, I do think that, that uh, communal values, shared values, and uh, people working together in groups, however small and large the groups might be, does 
give a great sense of purpose. When, when people join things, a political movement, for example, or for that matter, a church, and they have a common purpose, that can be a source of, uh, of really deep um, uh, meaningfulness for people. But in the end, the meaning of an individual life is something that the individual, himself or herself, has to, has to choose and work at. And the working at it, of course, can itself be a tremendous pleasure and is in itself constitutive of what a good life is. Only think of this. The people that we really care about, the people we admire, not only do we care about them or admire them because of what they achieve, but because of what they sincerely want to achieve. That is something that we like about our friends, for example, that uh, there are things that they would like to do and to be which, which are really worthwhile, and we like the effort that they make in that respect. So both at the individual level, and certainly at the individual level, uh, and at the communal level, there are sources of significance in, in life, and we should embrace them. Gentlemen on my right. Yeah. Um, so you seem to frame in your talk, uh, talk that uh, rel frame religion as a source of, of many of the world's problems. But I was just wondering, to what extent is uh, religion a source of problems as, as opposed to like other social justice issues like uh, racism and sexism? And like, to what extent are these things orthogonal? Because the, thing, the fact of the matter is that um, you seem to be suggesting that if people were less religious, people would be better. But it's, it's not the case that, uh, that atheists, atheists can't be bigots in, in, their, in, in, in other ways. Like, uh, for example, this is, like, this is a phenomenon of like white knight atheism, whereby an atheist, usually a male one, tries to explain to like, religious women how oppressed they are, even when they may not feel particularly oppressed. Like, oh, it's like, oh you're forced to wear headdresses. That's terrible, or something like that. Um, well, you're right, of course, that there are other sources of problems in the world and other reasons for injustice, and that uh, uh, secular dispensations not guarantee just in virtue of being so, of being good dispensations. In fact, it's an interesting point, this, that uh, um, Stalinism and Nazism and the Catholicism of Torquemada, or a a any, any coercive structure which tries to impose this one-size-fits-all view on people, is the problem. It doesn't really matter so much what the actual beliefs are, but the, the way that it operates. So it's ideology, it's coercive ideology, monolithic ideology, which is the real source of the problem. It's no surprise, by the way, that uh, Stalin himself had been educated in a monastery and was you know, hoping to become a priest. He must have, must have learned from history some of the techniques of of uh, organization and coercion from some very good historical exemplars. So I, I don't want to just you know, l load the whole blame on, on religion as such, but religions are human inventions. And uh, l like all um, monolithic structures, which have the purpose of dragooning everybody into the same way of behaving, same way of, of uh, believing, and into obedience, uh, they, they have these deleterious effects. Because I must remind you of one thing. Think about, think about the great the, 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 the principle that underlies uh, um, Christianity, for example, is that we are all born with a kind of moral disease, and we need salvation, we need cure. And the way we get that salvation is by submitting ourselves to the will of God. Then that main prayer, uh, our Father, you know, not my will be done, but thy will be done. The great sin in Christianity is the sin of pride, to think that you can do it for yourself. Islam means submission. Uh, it's a constantly recurring theme in religions that you mustn't think for yourself. You must submit. You must submit your will to the control of dot, dot, dot. And then, of course, the priests will tell you that it's God, but actually it's the organization. It's the priests or the mullahs or the, or the church. And, and, it, and that's no different in its uh, structure from Stalinism or, or uh, any other kind of totalitarian regime. They are all totalizing ideologies. And that's the reason why they're a problem. <laughs> now there are cup, quite a number of hands up. And any uh, official representative of the organizers here uh, to tell us when we must absolutely get out of this room? <laughs> Can somebody give us a firm? Uh, if not, uh, could could we just go for one maybe last couple of questions? We uh, could sit in, couldn't we? Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, please raise your hand so that I can see. So, okay, I think this hand came up first, yes? Yeah. 
I would like to. Uh, use, please use the mic and, and be very succinct. Okay, I am, I'm going to be. Uh, one of the topics that has come up time and again recently is about the uh, disparity between the rich and the poor and how the gap is widening. And uh, your idea about a considered life. Um, it's quite attainable to the, uh, the privileged of the, of the society. Now, how do you come to terms with the fact that the poor, the ill, the malnourished, the trafficked child, the underprivileged, they may not have the opportunity for the considered life? Yes, I agree. This is a very, very important point. And I did mention in the course of my talk that I think uh, the, uh, um, it's a really uh, essential aspect of uh, considered life that an awareness of these problems elsewhere and the taking of some action in connection with them um, should be part of it. I mentioned uh, Peter Singer, um, this irrefutable argument that each of us who has uh, resources in our lives could quite easily apportion a little of our resources to try to help others um, without injuring our own prospects or without taking anything away very much from our own families. And I think people should do this. I do think it's a moral obligation that we should try to be good neighbors to our friends in, in the human story. Uh, so um, according to the kind of figures that uh, Peter Singer comes up with, something like reduction of, of world poverty, some significant percentage reduction of world po poverty could be achieved if each one of us did just a little bit. Okay. Uh, I don't know whether, Philip, I see you in the crowd. You are the chair of the steering committee of, the, of this whole festival. How long can we go? It's, oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, I see a hand there. Did you say four minutes? Four o'clock. said four o'clock. You said four o'clock, okay. <laughs> All right, let's relax a little. <laughs> All right, did I see a hand there? Yes, please. Uh, sorry, the gentleman in the blue t shirt. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Hi. Um, you mentioned Peter Singer, uh, and you've also talked about the importance of how we treat uh, other people. And I just wondered whether you think it's possible to lead a good life whilst also eating animals, whether that's something that should be considered as well. Um, well, I, I speak... Uh, I, I should declare an interest here. I am a vegetarian. I'm also a teetotaler, by the way, which horrifies people because the combination of vegetarianism and teetotalism... You know, people do say that uh, you don't live longer. It just really feels that way if you... <laughs> I'm a teetotaler, not for moral reasons, but just because very small quantities of alcohol give me a terrible headache. It's just really bad luck. But, but the, the vegetarianism thing, <coughs> you know, people point out to me that, that I wear leather shoes, and they say, that's inconsistent. And I say, yes, it is. <laughs> and a little bit of inconsistency in life is kind of unavoidable in a way. But making, making uh, some effort, some gesture towards thinking that uh, the mass slaughter of uh, sentient creatures is not something that I really want to be fully a part of. And that's a personal moral choice. I think the world economy uh, is so geared to the production and shipment and consumption of meat that it would be a huge thing to try to change people's minds. And the effort of proselytizing people to vegetarianism probably fail, probably be futile, at least in the short term. But I do think the world would be a better place. I think uh, less uh, um, burping by cattle uh, might help with the <coughs> climate problem as well. And um, the, the, the fact that more people can be fed on an acre of land if you grow grain on it than if you run cattle on it uh, is a factor. Although, in fact, I don't think there is a food shortage in the world, but there is a distribution problem, a sharing problem. Mountains of food are left uneaten in rich countries, and there's not enough to go around in poor countries. Uh, so there are a number of different difficulties. Uh, but in general, I'm, I'm with you on, on this. If the implication of your remark is, wouldn't we be better off if we were kinder to animals, the answer is yes, definitely. Was there another question in this corner? Yeah. Yes, please. And let's make it succinct. Yeah, hi. Yeah, I've always thought that Darwin and e evolution, etc., should have put paid to the idea of monotheist religions, but it didn't. Um, do you think any b discovery or belief in the future will have this effect? Well, um, the, the effect <coughs> on uh, uh, massive traditions like religious traditions in, world, um, in, in the world tends to take time. <coughs> My own feeling about what's happening in our contemporary world is that 
as a result of globalization, or globalization started in the 15th century with the Portuguese explorers, and has increased and increased and increased and is now sort of exponentially, um, perhaps it's happened that the world is practically globalized now. And as a result, ideas and ways of thinking have impacted on more traditional ideas and ways of thinking, and the result is in the short-term conflict. You can imagine how somebody of a very traditional religious outlook um, presented with the, the, the secular lifestyle of a wealthy Western country he might be very disturbed by it, and very anxious about his children and what effect it would have on them. And it might make uh, some of that reaction violent, and we've seen that in, in the last uh, decade or so. But what it suggests to me is that uh, religion is, is on the back foot. And the, it's not that, pe that more people are becoming religious or that r religion is resurgent, but that the volume has gone up, the volume of anxiety and complaint. It sort of happens if you corner somebody or an animal, they'll tend to fight back a bit harder than they had when they're not, not cornered. And I get the sense that what, that's what's happening in our world is that um, we're at another of those bottleneck stages where things are changing and people who don't like the change are, uh, are, are really struggling and, and sort of lashing out as a result. Future historians in 500 years or 1,000 years' time might look back at this period as um, a, uh, a really serious jolt in the process that began back in the 18th century. And you look at the most of the Western world, and even in the United States of America, which people think of as a very religious country, but you look at the Pew Center polling data for the last 50 years, and religious observance there is decreasing dramatically among the under 35s, for example, the proportion of the population who are nuns, that is N-O-N-E, they tick the nun box when it comes to religion, and I think <laughs> they're called nuns, uh, is, is rising very, very <coughs> fast. So everywhere in the, certainly in the Western world, religion is in decline. Uh, in places like West Africa, where it seems to be on the increase, it's not uh, um, uh, actual numerical increases, people switching from traditional beliefs to Christian beliefs. Because in these megachurches, they're promised, I mean, they're, it's on the record, a public record, that they're promised a cure for AIDS and wealth if they would join the church. So, you know, it's at a very sort of primitive stage, really, of, of uh, proselytization in those countries. So it seems to me that what we are witnessing is the decline of religion, and the decline of religion is being noisy and sometimes violent and dangerous. And if we can get through this phase in 100 years' time, we'll all be around, by the way, stem cell research and medical advances. <laughs> In a hundred years' time, we, we'll see that, uh, um, that things have changed in a much more uh, secular direction. Okay. And now I'm only going to look on this side of the room. Uh, this gentleman, yes, please. Uh, Do I need yes, to the, the man, young man in the black. Um, uh, what hi. Hi. Um, Very um, quickly. Oh yeah, just a short question, right? First, you say that um, there's no one-size-fits-all morality. But then, um, it but seems, like, seems like you're saying that um, what the good life is doing whatever we want and with the principle of not harming others. So would you suggest that that is the one-size-fits-all morality? Thank you. Well, here's a good philosophical answer for you. Yes and no. I mean, <laughs> in, in, insofar as it's a very general principle, um, but, but what it's not doing is it's not imposing on anybody some particular principle or set of principles. It's, it's rather uh, serving as a kind of challenge or invitation to make some choices, to do some thinking and make some choices on the basis of it, um, which is as sensitive as it can be to the capacities, the capabilities that you have for doing that thing well. The business about not harming others, of course, comes from John Stuart Mill in On Liberty, the harm principle. You know, try as far as, as possible um, to see to it that what you do and what you choose to do enhances things rather than harms things. I did say at the outset that it's very difficult to do that because you know sometimes, for example, in a in a marriage uh, later on, um, uh, people might cease to be happy with one another and want another chance to form happy relationships, and that can be a very unhappy time for one or both people in a marriage. So you think, well, I mustn't do any harm to anybody, so I mustn't do that. But then there's self harm there, or there's harm to a third party. It, it's, it's difficult to to, to live without sometimes treading on people's toes. But one should really try to minimize that. And if the fundamental underlying principle of one's attitude and actions respecting other people is kindness, kindness is a very, very simple thing, but it's a very beautiful thing. And you think about um, trying to be kind in one's 
um, behavior towards others, it really does sweeten almost all the transactions one has with them. We have time for only one last burning question, and it has to be burning. So I don't know how to choose. Uh, we may have to go into a bidding war. Who feels that the person who feels that it, he has or he or she has to answer the question? Please stand up right now. <laughs> okay. Sorry, how hi, about Professor. this? If you can, if the three of you standing can can just use one sentence each, then we'll have Professor Grayling have the last word of the day. Very quickly. First, maybe the lady on the left. Uh, one sentence. Virtues for the twenty-first century. What would they be? Okay, Se second question. Is uh, having good assumptions so important um, if bad assumptions can lead to stuff like Newtonian physics? Sorry, did you catch that? Uh, sort of, yes. Yeah. Okay, and last one of the day. Yes. Um, I didn't quite catch that. Can you shout louder? Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Can you okay, so, so yeah, yeah. Virtue. Kindness, virtue. Kindness, kindness, uh, thoughtfulness, um, being open constantly. I mean, they say having an open mind is a great virtue. Not so open that your brains fall out, of course. You must have some principles and standards. But, but being, being open, being open to the world, I, I, I think that's great. Um, your, your question, just remind me quickly. Yeah. Just shout it. Oh yes, it's ter well. The, the 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 point about assumptions is that one should know what they are. I mean, you might find that when you examine them, that you still agree with them, or you still want them to be assumptions. But you should know what they are. It's the it's the buried assumptions which can cause problems if they are the wrong ones to have. And when I look at the stars, I'm reminded of the following fact: that all he heavy um, elements, uh, such as we are composed of had to be made in very great temperatures in thermonuclear reactions. That every one of us is made out of stuff which was quite literally produced in stars. We're all made of stardust. We're all part of the most magnificent thing there is, which is nature. And that when we die, we go back into nature, and our fact, the fact that we were here in the world, itself never dies. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that will do for today. Thank you. A round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.